Hi, you're watching Iniverse English. A dark, hooded figure hurries into a building, informing the leader that it is no longer safe and someone is coming for them. The leader asks who it is, and the hooded figure inquires if he has yet to hear the rumors circulating in the streets. The person coming has many names. Some call him the Vampire Slayer or the Iron Slaughterer, but most know him as the Master of the Blue Devils, and he is heading their way with his undead. The Master of the Blue Devils arrives outside the building while the hooded figure tries to convince the leader to flee. He commands his zombies to tear apart the guards stationed outside. Inside, the leader reassures the hooded figure that they have nothing to fear, as they have the best holy knights with them. The hooded figure falls to his knees, trembling with fear. It becomes clear that the holy knights have already been defeated and turned into undead. At the same time, the master of the blue devil stands outside the building and orders the undead to kill everyone inside. The undead rush in, causing panic among the Dark Order members. They tear apart everyone except for the leader of the Dark Order. The leader is bewildered, as the undead are supposed to serve necromancers like him. The master of the blue devil steps on the leader, who remains defiant, and warns him that God will grant them salvation no matter how hard he tries. The master points his rifle at the leader's head and informs him that he will deliver that salvation. The leader feels divine power seeping into his skin. The master tells him that God's blessings will lead him to hell. With that, he blows the leader's head open like a watermelon. A few years before this incident, there were rumors of an exiled seventh prince, a disgrace to the Holy Kingdom. The prince had no morals and was considered the lowest of mankind. One day, the archbishop caught him harassing his daughter. Instead of accepting punishment and repenting, the prince trashed the archbishop's room and painted him as a slave of the goddess. The holy emperor was furious upon hearing about the prince's actions and sent him to the land of the dead spirits to reflect on his behavior. Instead of repenting, the prince engaged in more misconduct and eventually attempted suicide after being rejected by a girl. Miraculously, he survived when the rope snapped. Strangely, he emerged from the incident as a completely different person. He began working diligently at the cathedral and stayed out of trouble. The townspeople became obsessed with him, though some remained suspicious of his sudden transformation. Rumors spread throughout the town. Some believed a demon had entered his body as punishment for his blasphemy. Others thought he had made a pact with a demon. One person even claimed to have seen a corpse wandering around the cemetery. In the present, a group of zombies sit in a well-dignified manner, adding to the eerie atmosphere. The seventh prince stands before the dignified zombies. A status window appears, revealing his name as Alan All Falls, a 16-year-old necromancer. Alan closes the window, annoyed by its persistence. He addresses the undead, informing them of the bizarre rumors spreading in town due to their sightings. He fears being falsely accused of heresy. In reality, this person is not truly Alan. He was an ordinary individual living in Korea who suddenly found himself in the body of the disgraced prince as he hung by a rope. Discovering his new necromancy abilities through the status window, he used them to assist himself as a graveyard keeper, despite necromancy being branded as heresy in this world. Initially confused, he gradually adapted. He created a zombie to dig graves, another to carry bodies, and yet another to place gravestones on the tombs. Alan tells the zombies that he had a nice day because of their help. The zombies, taking it as a compliment, feel happy. Alan then tells them that all good things must come to an end and it's time to say their goodbyes. The zombies become agitated and start protesting, signs of rebellion visible on their faces. Alan, seeking to calm them, explains that he had a complicated life in Korea and now seeks a peaceful existence. He reassures them that he will reconsider his decision as he has grown closer to them. A zombie gives him a thumbs up, indicating approval of his decision. Alan then instructs them to resume their work if they don't want him to change his mind. Meanwhile, two people stand on the outskirts of the cemetery. One hears something unusual, but his comrade urges him to stop talking and push the cart. The body inside the cart looks unusual as well. They hurry toward the cathedral to ask Alan for help with their cursed village. In the village, a house emits an evil aura, 
and a pale person with white hair and red eyes seems to be living inside it. The villagers deliver the corpses to Alan, who asks if this is the last batch for the day. One of the villagers replies that these were the only corpses they could find on the outskirts of their village. Another villager then requests Alan to come with them to the village, explaining that it has been nearly annihilated and that the remaining villagers would feel safer with a prince among them. The second villager adds that they have stayed safe because they keep seeing Alan. Both villagers start begging the prince, believing that his presence will protect them from the sickness. Alan suspects a misunderstanding but agrees to accompany the villagers. Upon arriving, he finds the village in a terrifying state. One of the villagers explains that the waterworks have stopped functioning, which is why there are many deep water ponds scattered around. Alan insists that the villagers stay away from him, but they remain convinced that he is their lucky charm. He urges them to begin searching the houses simultaneously. As they do, something moves nearby. Alan notices it, but the villagers attribute it to the wind. Determined, Alan tries to pursue the unknown presence, while the villagers plead with him to remain by their side. Unsettled by the situation, Alan senses a small presence with a menacing aura. He becomes alert upon hearing a squeaking sound, only to discover it's just a mouse. However, the mouse behaves oddly, approaching Alan in a way unusual for such fearful creatures. Suddenly, the mouse's eyes turn blood red, and its veins bulge as if ready to burst. More infected rats emerge from the rat hole, displaying aggression as they charge toward Alan. Upon closer inspection, Alan realizes they are zombie rats, possibly the cause of the village's troubles. Swiftly, he brushes them off and begins smashing them with his cemetery shovel. Despite Alan's efforts, the remaining rats become enraged by the deaths of their kin and attack him once more. Overwhelmed, Alan falls to the ground, losing his grip on the shovel, which falls into a dirty pond nearby. As the shovel sinks to the bottom, it begins to glow, activating a skill imbued within it. The skill, known as Swap of Death, purifies the dirty pond with holy water, sweeping away all the rats in its path. Alan is astonished, unaware that he possesses such abilities. As the villagers arrive, they speculate that the rats may have been the source of the disease that ravaged the village and that Alan somehow purified them with holy water. Alan retrieves his shovel from the pond, realizing he can use skills beyond raising zombies. Contemplating his class in necromancy, Alan considers his lineage as the grandson of the Holy Emperor, theorizing that it might enable him to wield holy skills as well. This could explain why the zombies he raised were kinder than usual. His thoughts are interrupted by the approach of a groaning sound. Recognizing her as Charlotte, a neighbor, the villagers express relief that she survived and explain their mission to rescue all remaining villagers. They inquire about other survivors, but Charlotte, hiding a kitchen knife, suddenly attacks them. Reacting swiftly, Alan blocks her assault with his shovel. Recognizing her ability to wield tools, he concludes she's not a typical zombie. Alan asks if she's still alive, but Charlotte, in tears, calls out for her parents. As the girl strikes Alan once again, his shovel begins to glow, indicating the activation of a skill. The holy power burns the girl's body, and realizing she's doomed, Alan pushes her toward the holy pond. Despite her attempts to resist, Alan submerges her completely. Exhausted from the struggle, Alan watches as the girl remains motionless in the purified water. Days pass, and more villagers hear of Alan's actions in the other village. They seek his help, but Alan denies any involvement in saving the girl, stating that she died. He explains that while he is related to the Holy Emperor by blood, he lacks any special abilities to save anyone. Disappointed, the villagers regret their journey, feeling it was all in vain. Alan questions who told them he saved people, puzzled by the misinformation. Suddenly, the first villager bursts into the room, having survived Charlotte's attack. Oblivious to the situation, he excitedly informs Alan of Charlotte's awakening, praising him for his supposed heroism in the other village. Perplexed by the crowd of guests, the villagers grow angry at Alan for deceiving them. Alan rises, reluctantly agreeing to help since he feels he has no other choice. But he sets conditions. 
He notes village elder Parlock's suspicion and lack of trust due to Alan's status as a disgraced prince. Asserting his terms, Alan insists he won't work for free and demands payment and supplies for his services. He also requests the villagers repair the cathedral at no cost, which displeases them. As Alan begins to leave, the villagers, alarmed, reluctantly agree to his conditions. Adding one final condition, Alan insists they keep their dealings with him hidden from the Holy Knights, a request the villagers reluctantly accept. Satisfied with the arrangement, Alan looks forward to living in a well-maintained cathedral, reminiscent of his status as an exiled prince. Parlock informs Alan that 30 corpses in his village have turned into zombies. Alan quickly grabs his gear and instructs everyone else to prepare their weapons as well. Though they ask him to handle the zombies alone, Alan insists on using his holy powers while the villagers engage in combat. Suspicious of Alan, the villagers begin to doubt his true intentions, wondering if he's not a holy prince but a demon. Suddenly, eerie voices are heard from outside and a villager checking the windows informs them that the zombies have followed them. Instructing the villagers to quickly retrieve gear from storage, Alan emphasizes that they'll use everything available, from mops to tools, in the fight. Within minutes, the zombie horde approaches the building, revealing far more than the initially reported 30 zombies. Confronted by the larger threat, Alan demands an explanation from the chief for the discrepancy in zombie numbers. The chief admits he may have miscounted in the chaos. With no time to spare, the villagers rush outside to confront the oncoming horde. In the intense battle, the villagers suffer losses as they struggle against the zombie horde. Alan pushes back a zombie with his shovel before unleashing his swap of death skill, summoning holy water to vanquish the zombies. The creatures wail in agony as they perish from the divine attack. Alan's proficiency with the necromancer class comes from his experience playing the virtual reality game Bia Testing, where he earned some income before his untimely death from electrocution. When he regained consciousness in this new body, he found that his skills from the game had transferred over. However, the divine power inherent in his new body altered his necromancy skills, making them harder to control. Every time he uses a skill, the divine power spills out uncontrollably. Alan is brought back to reality by the cries of a villager who can no longer bear the sight of his wife among the zombie horde. As his wife approaches, Alan finds himself unable to muster the courage to harm her. Just as the female zombie attempts to bite her husband, Alan swiftly intervenes, striking her head with a shovel. Despite Alan's actions, a villager expresses anger towards him for injuring his wife, prompting Alan to admonish the villager to compose himself. Pointing out the deteriorating state of the woman, Alan urges the villager to confront the harsh reality. Her body is decaying, and her soul is lost. If the villager wishes to spare his wife further suffering, Alan suggests ceasing the fight and fleeing. Amidst the chaos, Alan narrowly evades a zombie's attack, his attention diverted elsewhere. Suddenly, a figure descends from the sky. It's Charlotte. Crashing to the ground, she quickly rises and checks on Alan, addressing him as the prince. Charlotte recounts her recent ordeal of fleeing from infected rats in her village, nearly drained of energy before reaching safety at her home. After opening the main door, Charlotte frantically informed her parents about the swarms of rats outside. However, the scene that met her eyes shook her to the core. Her father was biting her mother, who remained conscious but gravely injured. With her last words, her mother urged Charlotte to flee. Young Charlotte, overwhelmed with fear, obeyed her mother's plea and ran. Within moments, Charlotte witnessed her mother's transformation into a zombie. As the rats closed in on the house, she found herself chased by her zombified parents. Armed with whatever she could find, Charlotte fought back, ultimately managing to kill them, albeit at a great cost. Yet, her victory was short-lived as others in the village began to succumb to the same fate. Despite initially being targeted by the rats, Charlotte found herself ignored by them afterwards, unsure if she, too, was undergoing a similar transformation. With no savior in sight, she clung to hope, longing for rescue. In the end, it was Alan who delivered her from that nightmare. Waking up in the cathedral, 
Charlotte questioned if the harrowing experience had been a dream. A woman informed her that the prince had appointed her as Charlotte's caretaker and warned of zombies outside, urging them to remain quiet. Through a window, they witnessed the ongoing battle. Suddenly, Charlotte's memories flooded back, and she opened the window. She leaps towards the prince, landing with a resounding impact, assuring him of her determination to save them all. As the fighting subsides hours later, the prince is astounded by what he witnesses. A pile of corpses created by Charlotte, leaving Alan bewildered by her newfound ability. Amidst the villagers' cheers for Charlotte, Alan ponders the transformation she underwent after being cleansed moments before nearly turning into a zombie. Uncertain of the effects of his abilities on her body, he calls for an end to the celebration, urging the villagers to tend to their deceased loved ones. Though weary, Alan stresses the importance of conducting the cleansing ritual promptly. Aware of their family members' suffering, they must release them from it. Alan pledges to assist in the ritual himself. In this world, the ritual is straightforward. A funeral is held for the deceased, accompanied by wishes for their peaceful rest to prevent their spirits from wandering. Resting the spirits serves as one of the reasons for Alan's exile to the land of the dead, as there is a high risk of spirits rising as zombies, necessitating someone to care for the deceased. Despite the unusual circumstances, Alan is puzzled by the rapid spread of infection across multiple villages, occurring much earlier than the anticipated wave of the dead. Seeking answers, he summons the village chief, Al, and inquires about any recent peculiar occurrences or unfamiliar faces in the village. However, the chief assures him of nothing out of the ordinary, mentioning that the plague began approximately a month ago. When Alan probes about the presence of a necromancer, the villagers' fear becomes palpable, vehemently denying any association with such dark magic. Though Alan empathizes with their discomfort, he acknowledges the validity of his theory. Someone must be controlling the zombies nearby, yet he's uncertain how to locate them. Deciding to retire for the night, Alan leaves the villagers to manage their affairs. Exhausted, he retreats to his room and quickly succumbs to sleep. However, his rest is interrupted by a piercing scream, rousing him from slumber. Bewildered by the commotion at such an early hour, Alan learns from a distressed villager that a person has been abducted by the zombies. Alan steps outside to assess the situation, where a villager reports witnessing a zombie kidnapping someone in the cemetery. They recount hearing cries for help and seeing Moran being abducted by the zombie. When Alan inquires about Moran, the villager describes her as the young lady who gathers herbs. Alan asks if he knows her, prompting the villager to mention her beauty and recall Alan's past confession of love to her, followed by a mention of a suicide attempt after rejection. Alan halts them, unable to recall those events, and urges them to focus on finding Moran. Despite the urgency of the situation, Alan senses the villager's sudden enthusiasm stems from Moran's attractiveness. Nevertheless, he recognizes the need to confirm the situation firsthand, as it's his first encounter with a zombie kidnapping a human. Considering tracking options, Alan learns of a hunter named Sir Hans who may assist. Deciding to form a search party, Alan orders immediate departure, met with agreement from the villagers. He instructs them to inform Sir Hans to join them swiftly. Alan scans his surroundings and notices Charlotte standing nearby, her gaze fixed on him. As she approaches, silence hangs between them, leaving Alan uncertain if Charlotte harbors resentment for his past actions of knocking her out. Despite the ambiguity, Alan joins the villagers and departs for the search. Hours later, Hans provides valuable insight, noting the distinct traces left by zombies dragging their feet and indicating a cave as the likely destination. Sensing an eerie atmosphere emanating from the cave, the villagers express unease while Alan commends Hans for his expertise. The cave exudes a foreboding aura, suggesting it may have once housed a horde of zombies, potentially serving as the origin of the plague. With recent zombie activity indicating possible manipulation, Alan contemplates sealing the cave entrance. However, the villagers plead against it, mentioning someone named Unk inside. Alan warns of heightened undead presence within the cave cautioning against rushing in to save a single individual, lest they succumb to the same fate. 
A villager queries Alan on their plan to rescue Moran, prompting Alan to suggest a strategic retreat for better preparation. However, his words are cut short by a gruesome sound, signaling the sudden appearance of a zombie bear behind him. Before Alan can react, the bear lunges, sinking its teeth into his shoulder. Despite his efforts to fend it off, the bear's superior strength overwhelms him, dragging him into the cave as the villagers scramble to intervene. Helpless, Alan is hurled off a cliff by the relentless bear. Inside the cave, Alan brandishes his shovel, employing his swap of death skill to pull the bear down with him. Both Plummet and Alan grimaces in agony. Resorting to his terrible curse skill to mend his wounded shoulder, Alan feels the strain of depleted divine power. Simultaneously, the undead menace closes in from behind. Dubbed the King of Gluttony, the zombie bear possesses formidable abilities, including biting, crushing, slashing, and organ-piercing prowess, enhanced by necromantic influence. Even a blast of holy water fails to subdue it, bolstered by necromantic enhancements. Facing an uncertain outcome, Alan doubts his ability to overcome the beast through sheer force alone. Swiftly, the bear lunges at Alan, but he deftly evades its bite. However, its claw attack nearly lands before Charlotte intervenes, her place piercing the bear's eye, sending it into a frenzy. Alan urges Charlotte to restrain the bear, but her grip falters and she is tossed aside. Seizing the moment, the bear prepares to devour Charlotte whole. In a daring move, Charlotte thrusts her knife into the bear's mouth, exerting force to deepen the wound. With relentless determination, she slashes open the bear's side, sending it crashing into a wall. Grateful for the time she bought him, Alan prepares to activate his skill, but Charlotte notices something amiss. The roughness of Alan's hand raises suspicions that he may have turned into a zombie. As zombies emerge from the ground, Alan recognizes this as the optimal strategy for the battle. Within moments, the area is teeming with the undead, overwhelming the zombie bear with sheer numbers. Alan observes that the bear stands no chance against the horde. Despite the bear's attempts to fend off the zombies by hurling them into walls, its efforts prove futile against the relentless tide of the undead. Alan surmises that the bear's previous killing spree provides him with the ability to summon so many zombies. Though the bear's durability surpasses that of Alan's zombies, exhaustion eventually takes its toll. As the bear nears Alan after dispatching the last of the zombies, it collapses upon being struck by a knife, signaling its demise. Reflecting on the inevitable outcome of the fight, Alan suddenly feels weakened, prompting Charlotte to assist him. Alan attributes his fatigue to the excessive use of divine power. He confides in Charlotte, expressing a desire to live quietly as an exiled prince and urging her to keep his powers a secret. Charlotte declares Alan her lifesaver, pledging to heed his wishes. As they converse, villagers arrive, prompting inquiries about Charlotte's plunge and informing Alan of their gear for cave exploration. Amidst their dialogue, Alan contemplates the unwelcome arrival of the villagers. One of them descends while Alan muses on the regret of their presence. The villager queries Alan about the decimation of the zombies and the bear, revealing the bear's notorious reputation as the king of gluttony, notorious for past harm. Alan conjectures a necromancer's presence in the cave, speculating that the bear was slain by this necromancer to claim the territory. The villagers accept Alan's explanation unquestioningly, which he perceives as their naivety, lamenting the likely demise of Moran. Alan suspects the necromancer orchestrated Moran's capture to lure more victims with the bear. When asked about their next move, Alan proposes advancing deeper into the cave, demonstrating curiosity about the necromancer's prowess. With urgency, they press deeper into the cave until they reach a small pond. A villager spots something and alerts Alan to Moran's presence. Despite the villager's immediate impulse to rescue her, Alan senses something amiss. Moran has served her purpose as bait, and Alan finds it suspicious that she remains unharmed. Approaching Moran, Alan observes her apparent contentment at the rescue attempt. However, without hesitation, he strikes her with a shovel. Shocked, the villagers and Charlotte witness this act of violence. As Moran collapses, Alan criticizes himself for not using the sharper edge of the shovel. 
The villagers rush to Moran's aid, questioning Alan's actions. Alan reveals that he checked Moran's status window, discovering her true identity as Morgana. A 63-year-old with skills in manipulation, curse casting, and assassination. Moran, in fact, was the necromancer all along, not the bait as previously assumed. Morgana attempts to explain herself, but Alan silences her, adamant that he won't be deceived again. Addressing the villagers, he exposes Moran's true identity as a necromancer, including her fabricated name and age. Moran claims she was coerced and tortured by the real necromancer. Alan produces a bottle of holy water and instructs Moran to drink it. While holy water is a boon to humans, it's lethal to necromancers, causing their organs to dissolve. Moran protests, acknowledging the preciousness of the gift. Alan insists, emphasizing her deservingness. Confounded by Alan's revelation, Moran marvels at his ability to discern her true nature despite her flawless disguise. She wonders about his powers and how he vanquished the zombie bear. Alan presses her to drink the holy water, reminding her of his princely status and the significance of the gift. In a final plea, Alan demands Moran's acceptance of the holy water, emphasizing the honor of receiving such a gift from a prince. Morana discards her disguise, revealing her true visage, and confesses her intention to eliminate Alan during the wave of death. She shatters the holy water bottle with a thrown stone, summoning a horde of skeletons. She admits to prolonging Alan's life until he uncovers her identity, accusing him of hastening his demise by exposing her. Morana taunts Alan, urging him to prepare for his demise as the skirmish commences. Alan engages in battle, smashing the skeletons with his shovel and commanding them to return to the earth. Meanwhile, Charlotte sneaks up behind Morana, effortlessly pinning her down as Alan subdues the skeletons. Observing Alan's prowess with the shovel, Morana ponders its significance, prompting Alan to jest about the shovel industry's advancements. Morana persists in belittling the shovel's status as a holy relic, but Alan retorts, questioning her arrogance in the face of impending defeat. Alan admonishes Morana to focus on her own predicament. Despite enduring a brief bout of punches, Morana capitulates, confessing her true identity as Morgana, a 63-year-old necromancer. Her revelation shatters the hopes of the young men in the village. Morana pleads with Alan for mercy, offering to divulge information about the one who ordered his assassination. She reveals being tasked with seducing Alan and staging his suicide. Alan realizes the true circumstances surrounding the previous Alan's death, doubting his predecessor's supposed weakness. Through telepathy, Morana discloses to Alan that the Dark Order commissioned her to kill the seventh grandson of the Holy Emperor. She also unveils Alan's own necromantic abilities, warning of the Order's relentless pursuit if they discover his secret. Alan contemplates Morana's betrayal but concludes that her knowledge poses a threat. Morana implores Alan to spare her life, promising to keep his secret and disclose everything about the Dark Order. Alan strikes Morana's face, dismissing her easy compliance as rendering her information worthless. Stepping back, he defers to the villagers to determine her fate. Fueled by grief and vengeance for their lost loved ones, the villagers reject Morana's pleas for forgiveness, their hearts unyielding to mercy. Turning to the villagers, Alan inquires about their plans for Morana. They advocate for retribution proportional to her crimes. Torture until death, followed by abandonment in the forest to be consumed by scavengers. They deem it a fitting punishment for a necromancer who defiles the sanctity of the deceased. Agreeing with the villagers' verdict, Alan reflects on the brutality of the Middle Ages justice system. Yet, amidst the grim scene, he finds solace in uncovering the Dark Order's clandestine activities. With newfound necromancy books concealed in his inventory, Alan ponders the possibility of enhancing his abilities, including the potential to commune with spirits. However, he remains uncertain if such skills are attainable in his current circumstances. As Alan delves into the pages of the book, memories of Morgana's mention of the Wave of Death resurface. Determined to unravel the mystery surrounding the attempted assassination, he contemplates the possibility of familial betrayal, suspecting his siblings' involvement due to the ongoing battle for succession. 
Aware of the potential threat to his life, Alan contemplates hiring mercenaries for protection, recognizing the existence of a power struggle that could culminate in his demise. Focusing on honing his skills, Alan acknowledges the need to elevate his proficiency swiftly. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to him, Charlotte overhears his concerns in the cathedral, growing apprehensive about the looming danger to his highness. In the village, whispers circulate about the transformation of the seventh prince. Despite his perceived shortcomings in physical combat, he displays unwavering courage and takes decisive action to aid others. His compassionate deeds, including arranging funerals for the deceased and tending to the bodies of fallen villagers' loved ones, earned him widespread admiration and gratitude. One villager recounts how the seventh prince cared for her parents' remains while she was incapacitated, further solidifying his reputation as a benevolent leader. Deeply moved by the seventh prince's selfless acts, Charlotte feels compelled to offer more than mere gratitude. Recognizing the looming danger surrounding Alan, she resolves to become his shield and guardian. Initially motivated by a desire to express her thanks, Charlotte now understands the gravity of the situation and the prince's need for protection. Obtaining a guidebook on imperial swordsmanship, Charlotte commits herself to becoming stronger to fulfill her role in safeguarding the prince. Meanwhile, Alan, despite his princely stature, engages in playful antics, scribbling on the cathedral's windows like a child. In his studies, Alan comes across a book detailing the evolution of the undead. He learns that zombies gradually transform into skeletons as their bodies decay. However, if they maintain their corporeal form, they evolve into more powerful entities known as ghouls. Ghouls can further evolve into Dullahans and eventually into vampires, growing in intelligence and strength with each stage. The book reveals that undead creatures seek out darkness to expedite their evolution as the mana within darkness accelerates their growth. This desire for potent mana leads them to the land of the dead spirits, a legendary destination characterized by its dark and frigid environment, where they can preserve their flesh from decay caused by warmer climates. As winter approaches, the undead's instinct to seek the land of the dead intensifies, culminating in what is known as the wave of death. This phenomenon peaks on December 25th, the coldest day, coinciding with the death anniversary of Amon, the former king of the land of the dead. During this period, the undead fervently migrates to the land of the dead spirits in hopes of regaining their lost lives. With only a month remaining until the onset of the wave of death, Morgana plotted to exploit this event to eliminate Alan. After Alan finishes reading the book, Charlotte offers to return it to its place, assuming the role of his caretaker almost effortlessly. Although Alan never asked, Charlotte diligently tends to the church daily, not only organizing books but also undertaking cleaning, cemetery maintenance, and meal preparation without compensation. Alan speculates that Charlotte may eventually leave once she feels satisfied. He learns that a villager named Grill has welcomed her as his adopted daughter, providing her with a home to return to. Despite Grill's rough exterior, Alan acknowledges his kind nature. Suddenly, Three holy knights stride into the cathedral, their presence commanding attention. One of them, distinguished by his unique green eyes, seems to be specifically seeking Alan. Checking his status window, Alan identifies him as Harmon Dien, 33 years old, vice commander of the Knights of the Holy Cross. Harmon exhibits abilities in holy family swordsmanship and Heim's protection. Harmon wastes no time in addressing Alan, questioning him about the apprehension of the witch Morgana. Alan notes the directness of Harmon's approach, feeling somewhat like a scrutinized, exiled prince. He suspects the knights may have been monitoring him closely, given their prompt awareness of recent events. Acknowledging Harmon's inquiry, Alan confirms his involvement in capturing the necromancer with the assistance of the villagers. Harmon assures him they are here merely to ascertain the facts. He commends Alan for his valor in combat alongside the villagers, citing his reputed feat of slaying a predator king using only farming tools. Harmon also acknowledges Grill's role in dispatching zombies and aiding in cornering the necromancer with holy water. Alan asks them about who told them these things, and they say that the farmer Grill told these things himself. Alan thinks that within minutes of offering praise for Alan's valor, Harmon witnesses evidence of a formidable battle, validating Alan's actions. 
Despite initial skepticism, Harmon is convinced of Alan's role in defeating Morgana. Alan, however, questions the Holy Knight's apparent gullibility. Harmon inquires if Alan is aware of Morgana's affiliation with the Dark Order, to which Alan confirms, citing Morgana's own admission. Harmon condemns the Dark Order as a ruthless organization responsible for devastating numerous villages. Alan expresses remorse for his ignorance. Pressed again about Morgana's demise, Alan asserts that the villagers took matters into their own hands, subjecting her to torture before disposing of her body. Omen probes Alan about his involvement in Morgana's torture, but Alan feigns weakness, adhering to the fabricated narrative crafted by Grill. Downplaying his role, Alan claims to have merely been present during Morgana's demise, exaggerating his fear to distance himself from the gruesome act. Disgusted by Alan's behavior, the Holy Knights refrain from further interrogation, their disdain evident. Armin shifts the conversation to Morgana's books, but Alan feigns ignorance, maintaining his facade. The Holy Knights were tasked with retrieving books on dark magic, yet Morgana's bookshelf stood empty for an inexplicable reason. Alan, the true culprit, feigned innocence before the knights. Shamelessly, one of them suggested asking the villagers, implying they might have burned the books due to their ominous nature. Harmon produced a sizable pouch from his backpack, revealing that there was an 80 gold coin bounty on Morgana's head, stunning Alan. He received the pouch, filled with gold coins, and was instructed by Armin to share some with the villagers who aided him. Alan dismissively declined, displaying blatant greed that even surprised Harmon, a prince. While inspecting the bag of gold coins, Harmon revealed another purpose for their visit. He urged Alan to pack his belongings, shocking him. Alan feared another exile, but Harmon clarified that they were preparing to escort him away due to an impending wave of death. Alan's mind entertains the possibility that his royal status might still afford him some consideration. This thought brings him a faint sense of contentment, prompting him to ask Harmon if he'll be escorted to the familiar comforts of the Imperial Palace or the Balmy South. Harmon's response dashes his hopes, revealing that their destination is Lonia State. Surprised, Alan notes that Lonia State lies just half a day's journey from their current location, still within the perilous land of the dead. He questions the rationale behind evacuating to such a place. Harmon confirms that there is indeed a purpose. Lonia State stands as a fortress against the impending wave of death. The Holy Knights have mobilized soldiers and prisoners there, preparing to confront the zombie horde. This time, the casualties are expected to be significant, necessitating such a strategic relocation. Harmon's request for funerals at Lonia Estate catches both Alan and Charlotte off guard, leaving them in stunned silence. The following day, Alan arrives at Lonia Estate to a warm welcome from Janard Ling, a comforting and merciful feudal lord. Janard expresses his delight at Alan's presence and inquires about his well-being. However, Alan, still reeling from recent events, curtly brushes off Janard's concern, claiming he's not feeling well due to the discomfort of the journey. Janard turns to Grill, curious about his identity. Grill proudly declares himself as someone of importance, but Charlotte corrects Janard, stating that Grill is merely a servant. Despite being an exiled prince, Alan's mood lightens slightly at the warm reception. He urges Janard to cease the pleasantries and lead him to his quarters. Lonia Estate holds a notorious reputation in the kingdom, known as the Land of the Dead Spirits and dubbed the Sacrificial Fortress. Its grim moniker stems from its role as a gathering place for victims who appease the wrath of the dead. The entire estate is dedicated to thwarting the wave of death, requiring residents to endure relentless zombie attacks for an entire month each year. Prisoners and soldiers are conscripted annually to bolster the defenses against the relentless onslaught. Harmon briefs Alan on his responsibilities, explaining that he simply needs to oversee the funeral arrangements and provide support to the grieving. Alan assures Harmon that he can handle this task. However, when Harmon reveals the staggering annual death toll of 2,000 to 3,000 casualties, Alan is taken aback. He queries if there will be additional assistance, to which Harmon mentions the presence of 80 priests capable of conducting purification rituals. Harmon reassures Alan that the soldiers will aid him in managing the funerals, even though some deaths may result from exhaustion. 
With a heavy heart, Alan heads straight to the quarters of feudal Lord Jannard. He demands drinks from Jannard, unable to cope with the situation without alcohol. He jests that he would rather perish from excessive drinking than from exertion. Turning to Charlotte and Grill, he instructs them to enjoy themselves but reminds them to return before the impending wave of death as they must protect him. Alan retreats to his room with the drinks, craving some respite. Meanwhile, Charlotte expresses her desire for the prince to trust her capabilities, while Harmon privately reflects on Alan's lack of maturity. Once alone, Alan's demeanor shifts slightly, revealing that his previous demeanor was merely an act. His true purpose for requesting wine becomes apparent as he employs his skills on the bottle. The liquid inside begins to change color, transforming into holy water within moments. Alan realizes the necessity of having holy water to navigate the challenges ahead. Determined, he resolves to convert all the wine bottles into holy water, considering them his essential energy drinks. While in the process of converting the bottles, Alan notices a gun mounted on the wall. He handles the holy water bottles with care as he places them on the table, his mind already considering the potential uses of both the holy water and the firearm. Alan approaches the gun, intrigued by its presence. While he had read about guns in books, he hadn't realized they were this commonplace in his world. It's odd, considering that firearms are seldom used due to a unique twist. In this realm, guns operate on mana instead of gunpowder. Though anyone can wield them by channeling mana or holy power, they consume an exorbitant amount of mana with each shot. Even a seasoned wizard can only manage five shots and it takes five minutes to conjure a single bullet with mana. Consequently, firearms have become little more than antiquated relics. It's a disappointment for Alan, who had admired the sleek efficiency of guns seen in movies, particularly their ability to dispatch zombies with a single headshot. Undeterred, Alan decides to test the gun's capabilities. He infuses mana into the cartridge, aiming at the wall and imagining it as a zombie target. With a resounding blast, a burst of holy power erupts from the gun. A notification promptly appears, confirming his success in manifesting a bullet with holy power. Alan's face lights up with satisfaction at witnessing the formidable firepower of the gun. The holy energy unleashed is so potent that it even pierces through the wall of his room. However, he quickly realizes he's caused quite a commotion. Harmon rushes to the seventh prince's room upon hearing the loud bang. The following day, rumors spread among the guards that the vice commander is in a foul mood, possibly due to the impending wave of death. Harmon overhears their conversation and confronts them sharply. Must I remind you to focus on your duties rather than engaging in idle gossip? His stern reprimand sends the guards scurrying back to their posts. Despite his outward frustration, Harmon acknowledges that the guards' concerns are not entirely unfounded. He questions whether he truly heard the loud noise or if it was merely a trick of his ears. When he attempts to investigate further, the seventh prince rebuffs him, insisting on privacy due to his supposed sensitivity as a teenager. Despite the dismissal, Harmon suspects that the seventh prince may have caused the disturbance. Harmon recalls the village chief's words about the prince's transformation following a failed suicide attempt. Despite skepticism, he acknowledges the prince's recent acts of bravery and leadership, earning him respect and gratitude from the villagers. However, Harmon suspects that the prince's newfound image may be a facade, concocted through manipulation or coercion. He ponders how someone as contemptible as the prince could have subdued a formidable necromancer like Morgana. Perhaps Grill, the prince's companion, played a significant role, while the prince reaped the rewards. Considering Grill's valor, Harmon contemplates drafting a recommendation letter for Grill to pursue a candidacy as a holy knight. Suddenly, he hears raised voices in the distance, prompting him to rush towards the source. To his astonishment, he discovers Prince Alan brandishing a shovel at a civilian, demanding recognition and respect. Harmon is taken aback by the prince's aggressive demeanor and wonders about the circumstances leading to this confrontation. In the aftermath of their arrival at Lonia Estate, Fatalities began to mount due to the epidemic and excessive labor. Alan found himself toiling relentlessly, outfitted with a bird's beak mask imbued with a purification spell to safeguard against infection. Amidst his laborious duties, 
Alan couldn't shake off his anticipation of the impending zombie threat. Suddenly, he was interrupted by a brusque voice from behind. Turning, he encountered his Hedron, the eldest son of Count Hedron, who urged Alan to join them and take a break. He speculated that Alan might be one of the Academy's students, but Alan remained clueless about any such Academy. A confronts Alan, questioning if he's at Lonia Estate as part of a disciplinary measure. They belittle him, insinuating that he must be a simpleton or a nobody from the countryside, hence his lack of exemption. One of A's lackeys warns Alan to heed Sir Hees's authority as the eldest son of Count Hedron or face dire consequences. T joins in, mocking Alan's presence and suggesting that he must have come to Lonia Estate in search of employment as a servant. He spots Charlotte in the distance and remarks that someone like her would make a suitable maid for him. T then cruelly implies that Alan might also be Charlotte's master. He recounts a disturbing anecdote from his time at the academy, where he mistreated a girl who eventually met a tragic end at his hands. Meanwhile, Alan recoils inwardly, repulsed by T's callousness and depravity. As Ellen decides to leave, deeming it preferable to dig holes than endure the company of such a despicable individual, he calls out to Charlotte, identifying her as a maid. Alan's attention is immediately drawn to the interaction. Charlotte approaches, inquiring if she was summoned. He's, seizing Charlotte's hand, startles her with his unwanted advances, insisting she join him instead of attending to her master's affairs. Despite Charlotte's polite refusal and attempts to leave, he's persists, unwilling to let her go. Growing increasingly frustrated, Charlotte applies pressure to He's's hand, causing him pain. Alan observes, realizing that Charlotte's strength could easily overpower He's if provoked further. He's withdraws his hand, recoiling from Charlotte's unexpected display of strength. Alan muses that Charlotte's formidable power suggests she may have grown up in a remote area, engaging in physically demanding labor. Amid Heese's relentless verbal assault, Alan's patience wears thin. Despite Alan's command to cease, Heese persists in his disrespectful tirade, eventually crossing a line by insulting Charlotte's parents. In a fit of rage, Ellen brandishes his shovel, narrowly missing Heese as he continues to prattle on obliviously. Alan feigns innocence, claiming his swing was a mistake while digging a grave. However, he follows it up with a deliberate punch to Heese's face, feigning another accident. The force of Alan's blow sends he sprawling to the ground. He attempts to assert his status, warning Alan of the consequences, but Alan counters with a threatening gesture, holding his shovel at Heese's neck and questioning his knowledge of Alan's background. Before the situation escalates further, Harmon intervenes, urging Alan to avoid causing further trouble. He demands punishment from Harmon, but Charlotte defends Alan, accusing he's of lying. Harmon, exasperated, informs Alan that he can't overlook the situation this time, as tensions reach a breaking point. In a desperate bid to silence the chaos, Alan casts a silent spell, rendering everyone speechless. Harmon struggles to speak, bewildered by the sudden silence, and questions whether Alan employed a holy incantation to enforce it. Alan calls out to Harmon using telepathy, and orders him to reveal Alan's identity. Harmon then informs Hees that Alan is the grandson of the Emperor and the Seventh Prince. Alan asks Hees if he now realizes whose maid he was rude to, and which one of them failed to show respect. As Hees begins to respond, Alan reassures him that there is no need to be scared. If he apologizes sincerely, there won't be any significant problems. However, something goes wrong, and Alan is imprisoned. Charlotte informs Alan that, according to Harmon, the injury inflicted on the nobleman's son cannot be forgiven. It turns out he's fainted at that time and was carried away immediately after. Charlotte apologizes to Alan because he is getting a week of probation because of her. Alan muses that in movies, the grandsons of emperors have more power than nobles. He tells Charlotte not to worry about him and that he will pass the time by reading a book. He adds that it's better this way since there is a blizzard outside. A guard comes running toward Harmon, informing him that he ordered the prisoners to clear the snow, but it's snowing so heavily that the task isn't progressing fast enough. Harmon, lost in thought, muses about how the seventh prince used an incantation despite being regarded as a good-for-nothing. 
Perhaps the blood of the holy emperor still runs thick in his veins. The guard's shout snaps Harmon back to reality. He instructs the guard that they must keep removing snow to maintain the castle wall at an optimal height. The holy emperor killed the dead spirit king on the 25th of December, but this time, there are very few zombies and only one more day remains. The guard asks Harmon if they should report this to the holy emperor. Harmon tells him to gather the prisoners and report back to the royal palace. The bell rings, calling the prisoners back inside the gate. They start heading back to the Lonia estate, but there seems to be a fresh casualty. Some undead are attacking and devouring unlucky prisoners. One of the guards spots the zombies and shouts for the gate to be closed. After some time, only a few manage to get inside, and the priests are ordered to quickly treat them. The survivor informs them that they were attacked from behind by zombies, and because of the blizzard, they couldn't spot them beforehand. Everyone who was at the rear was eaten by the zombies. Harmon quickly orders all soldiers to regroup and climb up the walls to prepare for a defensive battle. He realizes why it had been so quiet earlier. The zombies were bound to emerge as the anniversary of the dead spirit king's death approached. Soon, more than 3,000 undead will be gathered here. While the priests heal the survivors, Harmon ponders how this happened. This is the first time the zombies have attacked from behind. They must have been hiding under the snow, suppressing their instincts. Most of the undead have no functioning brains, know no fear, and act purely on instinct. Every year, the undead attacked in great numbers during the wave of the dead, but humans managed to fend them off because the undead lacked proper equipment and knew no strategies or tactics. This time, however, everything is different. The zombies start beating the drum, signaling the beginning of the war. All the undead gather outside in formations, resembling a perfectly coordinated army, an unprecedented sight that leaves Harmon and the other soldiers confused and worried. Suddenly, an undead being calls out to the humans, referring to them as living ones, and tells them to be afraid and long for their deaths. Some zombies emerge, carrying what appears to be their leader. The undead leader announces himself to the humans, proclaiming that he is the judge of this world, the messiah who will save it through death. He declares himself the successor to Udai, the god of death. His status window reveals he is the vampire count, though his real name is unknown. His skills and traits include bite, mana discharge, necromancy, and arrogance. The vampire count gives out an evil laugh, his appearance reminiscent of an overcooked, sinister potato. Meanwhile, Alan is still in jail, wondering about the noise outside. It's mealtime, but no one has brought his meal. He goes to the window to check the situation, but someone calls to him from behind. Alan reassures the person that he isn't trying to break out, but Count Jannard informs him that he is here to take him. Alan reminds him that he is still on probation, but Jannard insists that's not the issue right now. A legion of undead is outside the estate. Alan asks if they lack enough workers to handle the situation, but Jannard clarifies that there really is a legion of undead outside. He further explains that a vampire has brought this legion. Alan, skeptical, suggests that Jannard might have seen something wrong, questioning why a high-level monster would be there. Jannard confirms that the vampire speaks in human language and can control other monsters, indicating he is definitely a vampire count. Jannard admits he doesn't know the full situation outside, but Sir Heron is currently confronting the undead. The estate could fall at any moment, so they need to evacuate Alan to safety. Jannard urges Alan to follow him, but suddenly the whole building starts shaking. Jannard explains that this means the Legion is closing in on them, and they need to quickly evacuate through the back gate. Suddenly, a cluster of zombies rushes toward the cell window. Alan quickly moves out of the cell as the undead break through the prison wall and get inside. Both Alan and Count Jannard are shocked. It's their first time seeing a zombie lump. Jannard speculates that the undead must have lumped together a bunch of zombies and thrown them. Alan realizes that if they are being attacked like this, the outside must be swarming with those things. Alan quickly closes the cell door and tells Jannard to come to his senses and command the soldiers. He warns that if the Lona estate residents are hunted like this, there will be even more undead. Count Jannard runs off to find a safe place for the Lona estate residents to take shelter, while Alan contemplates his next move. So far, 
He has managed to handle everything because the challenges were within his capabilities. But this time he is completely outnumbered. With no other choice, Alan decides he must run away from here. Alan uses his holy water skill on the undead inside the prison cell. Within seconds, the zombies become immobilized. Seizing the opportunity, Alan moves into the cell and escapes through the hole made by the zombies. However, upon exiting, he is shocked by the scene before him. The undead are rampaging, killing every priest, civilian, and soldier they encounter. The residents of the Lonia estate are crying out for help. One resident continuously pleads for assistance as zombies bite him to death. Soldiers form a shield wall to hold back the zombies, but are horrified to find more zombies approaching from behind. The soldiers are brutally mauled to death, and Alan watches in horror as the scene unfolds. The pleas for help echo in his ears, amplifying the chaos and despair surrounding him. Alan is uncertain how long he can sustain his holy water supply. Determined to make a last stand, he raises his shovel and strikes the ground, pondering if the goddess is frustrated by her inability to control him. He channels all of his holy power to initiate a wide area blessing, covering himself in holy water. Alan then disperses the holy water into small droplets using a skill called debilitating epidemic, which transforms the droplets into a holy rain that emits a wave of intense, purifying energy. This wave pierces through both soldiers and undead alike. Amid the chaos, a single soldier survives from his regiment, his will to live shattered. A Dullahan approaches him, and the soldier resigns himself to death, believing the monster to be invincible. Alan quickly intervenes, using the soldier's shoulder to steady his aim. Apologizing to the soldier for the impromptu assistance, Alan points the gun at the Dullahan. Although it's only his second time using the gun, he manages to shoot the Dullahan. A big bang occurs as the holy bullet strikes the Dullahan, causing a massive explosion. Meanwhile, the vampire lord senses the energy of the living, envisioning them as fresh meat he hasn't tasted in 50 years. He anticipates that turning these humans into undead will strengthen his legion. The vampire lord recalls his evolution from an eagle zombie, driven purely by instinct, to a ghoul, then a Dullahan, and finally a zombie lord. After 50 years, he achieved the status of a vampire, gaining the ability to think and make judgments. Vampire ranks are determined by the mana they possess. Although other vampires haven't fully acknowledged him due to his recent transformation, he is confident in his power as a vampire count. This power stems from the skull of the dead spirit king. Thanks to this skull, he accumulated the required mana in a few decades that would have otherwise taken him at least 100 years. His legion now numbers 20,000 undead. He believes he will soon surpass the level of a count and walk the path of a king. The vampire lord no longer fears normal holy power. Confident and ambitious, he waits for the holy knights to surrender and join his legion. As soldiers continue to fire ballisti at the undead below, holy knight Harmon urges them to keep shooting, emphasizing the need to kill as many undead as possible before sunset when they become stronger. He understands that if the wall falls, so too will the Lonia estate. Recalling previous zombie infiltrations, he regrets his inability to aid the estate's residents due to the relentless onslaught. Battalion 4 ponders the consequences of the estate's potential destruction, realizing that only the Holy Emperor can provide salvation in such dire times. Suddenly, they hear a loud noise from behind. It's Charlotte, carrying ammunition for the ballisti and swords. She assures Harmon that the Lonia estate is safe with the seventh prince present, while she assists in holding off the undead legion. Harmon allows Charlotte to remain on the wall as she drops the heavy weapons. Despite assuming she was just a maid, Harmon is impressed by her strength, noting that even veteran soldiers would struggle to carry such a load. He commends Charlotte for her determination, reflecting on her diligence despite her young age. Determined to persevere, Harmon resolves to break through the Legion and confront the vampire alone if necessary. Some enormous undead are loading catapults with zombies, launching them toward the Lonia estate. Harmon warns Charlotte to stay behind him as the situation grows perilous. He begins to chant to Himen, the god of war, for strength, but Charlotte leaps ahead before he can complete his invocation. With a swift slash skill, 
She cuts through the flying horde of zombies, cleaving them into pieces that rain down across the estate. Charlotte lands outside the Lonia estate amidst the chaos. Meanwhile, Harmon marvels at Charlotte's ability to dispatch the zombies with ease. Typically, zombies cannot be killed with conventional weapons, yet those struck by Charlotte's sword remain incapacitated. There are only two known methods for defeating the undead, piercing their heads or using weapons imbued with holy power. However, Charlotte's sword appears ordinary, lacking any enchantments. Despite her unrefined technique, Charlotte continues to rampage through the waves of undead, effortlessly slicing through them like butter. From the castle walls, Harmon observes her crude yet effective swordsmanship, recognizing the signature style of the Holy Empire's imperial swordsmanship passed down to the Holy Cross squad.